As a grandfather of two girls, I was thrilled to learn my daughter was pregnant with a boy. I thought of all the things we would do together, like playing ball. Uh, that's just not been my reality. Uh, as a toddler, he wasn't interested in balls. He has, uh, she has uh, focused on uh, dolls, not balls. He started dressing a girl like a girl, mainly princess dresses uh, at age three at home. Uh, my his mother tried to dissuade him from doing so at age four. My intuitive wife asked the dress chair wearing child if he didn't like being a boy. His response was, quote, inside, I feel like a girl, close quote. My wife accepted that Jonah was different well before I did. I thought it was because he had an older sister that he was competing with. I hoped he would grow out of it, but that has not happened. I still screw up the pronoun thing, uh, but regardless of anything, I'm going to love my grandchild and fight for what I think is best for Jonah. Mm. For that reason, uh, I urge you to vote against that. Uh, am, I, am I projecting or seeing things, or does that not look like uh, Winston out of 1984, who has been forced to say 2 plus 2 equals 5? And, and imagine, like, it's not a question of not loving a kid, but imagine thinking that uh, you have to, you, your role as an adult is to cater to the um, fantasies of a child and to make those fantasies a reality instead of having realistic discussions with a child. I mean, if the kid says he's a pirate, you're going to support surgery to remove one eye and put a patch over it? It's, it's, but listening to that guy, I mean, I tell you, it sounded like he was reading a ransom note. Um, and he, that was posted on Vice News. And even reading the comments in the replies to Vice News, it seems like a lot of people have had enough of the bullshit. Sorry to start off uh, with a cuss word, uh, but uh, it won't be the last one of the stream, people. Today, we have on Gerald Salente. Now, those of you watching, we have an hour with Gerald. I'll probably stay on with locals afterwards to do a post-mortem, but we've got an hour. And for those of you who don't know Gerald Salente, uh, I don't think there's many of you because I think all of you knew of Gerald Salente before I did. My financial advisor in Montreal sends me a link and says, you might like this guy. And I got through about five minutes of one of the uh, one of his uh, videos and I liked the guy. And I listened to the entire video. I went on something of a binge and then I tweeted out a couple of, a couple of clips. And then they reached out to me and said, let's do a stream. And I said, how about tomorrow? And they said, yes. No time like the present. Gerald Salente, forecaster, not a financial advisor, uh, and an amazing history, an amazing present. Um, and without further ado, because we uh, don't have that much time, I'm going to bring in the man of the hour, Gerald Salente, in three, two, one. Gerald, sir, how goes the battle? Oh, thanks for having me on. You know, I was listening to what you were saying about that uh, guy reading that script. What the hell is a kid two, three years old? No, I mean, I don't even remember when I was two or three years old. You know, when I was a kid, you know, about not knowing anything, I'm about 17 years old, 18 years old, and my father may rest in peace reading dinner. And he said to me, you know, son, they say that youth is wasted on the young. He took a, took a couple more bites and he looked at me and so said, they were talking about you. I mean, you don't know anything when you're a young guy, you know, or a young, I mean, this is so, this is so out of whack. You know, we have a magazine, it's called the Trends Journal. So what we're going to do now is we're going to change the name. We're going to call it the Trans Journal. You know, we figure we get more subscribers. I mean, it, what a bunch of crap they're shoving down people's throat. Can, can you and this is, uh, with, the, the world is exploding in front of us. You know, you know, I, you know, I'm a, I, I'm, I'm 76 years old. I'm a guy in Napolitano, born in the Bronx, right at the height, the height of America, 1946, right after America wins the war. You were born to be free. You were born to be who you wanted to be. You know, take it easy, man. Don't tell me what to do. F you. Don't tell me what to do. Who the hell are you? Not anymore. I'll tell you what to do. Oh, you're from Canada originally, right? I'm st still from Canada. I'm yeah. down here temporarily, but yeah. How about how about that little daddy's boy you got up there? A little little boy of nothing. A little little arrogant little nothing. True dope. A little daddy's boy born on third base and thought he had a home run. An arrogant little boy. And look at all the little freaks they had. 
Oh, your, your health minister, you stay home. You stand six feet apart. You go to a restaurant. You put a mask on when you walk in. But when you sit down, you can take it off. Gerald. Look at the crap. I, I'm Look from at the crap that they shove down our throat and tell us where what to believe. Where are the men and women that stand up and say, F you, who the hell are you to tell me what to do? Gerald, I, I'm from Quebec. We were under curfew for five and a half months in 2021. Yeah. We couldn't leave our house after eight o'clock until five in the morning. And again in 2022. Before you get mad, I know, first of all, I, I, I love it, and it's it's righteous. And it's like, I, I was watching your clip, you know, uh, who the fuck are you to tell me what to do? And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, Rage Against the Machine once upon, once upon a time said that right before they said, you don't get into one of our concerts unless you're vaccinated. But let's back it up just a little bit because you have a, a, an amazing history. You're born in the Bronx in 1946. Your granddad was an Italian immigrant, an immigrant from Italy, correct? Yeah. So you're second generation American. What, look... Uh, what I know is I, I've watched movies. I've watched a Bronx tale. It was, it was magnificent. I used to be into all of the greatest movies because the greatest movies ever made uh, typically revolved around the greatest era ever, which was you know, a big span in, 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 uh, around that era. But what was life like growing up in America in the 50s? I mean, your conscious memory, I presume, is the 50s. How different was life then? What was it like? And how have you seen it fall off a cliff the way we have in the last 10 years? Well, one of the big things, you know, was the family was always getting together. And, you know, it, uh, it, it you know, every night, you know, it, you had to be home at six o'clock. You know, my father may rest in peace. May all rest in peace. You know, he, he was a laborer. You know, we'd, we'd all sit together and have dinner every, every night. And, and, and you were free. You know, I, I mean, I ran away from kindergarten at four and a half years old. <laughs> Ironically, it was PS 76, the spirit of 76. I ran away from kindergarten at four and a half years old, crossed the Boston Post Road in the Bronx, which was the major artery back then. They took me out of school. Today, they would have me shot up with drugs. I was the youngest of five, so they couldn't control me. They're tired after they have all those kids. And, and so I was the freest because you have all the brothers and so you, you, you're learning from them. I'm, I'm out of the house yelling next door to the kid, Georgie, could you come out and play? And the mother opened it. It's a 6 or 30 in the morning. Go back into your house. You were free as a little kid. You were free as a little kid. Some make it, some don't. You know, it's survival of the fittest. You know, some, you, you, they weren't watching over you. You know, you were free to be. I came home crying one time. I'm like six years old. My father, what are you crying about? Because it got beat up. You know, she don't come home crying. And I became the toughest kid because I was the smallest kid and bullies pick on the littlest kids. You were free to become yourself. You're on your own. You didn't get any allowances, none of this stuff. You're on your own. You become who you wanted to be. The spirit, my aunts and uncles. Yeah, this is one of my books. It was called What Zizzy Gave Honey Boy. Zitzi is the Neapolitan dialect for auntie. And here's a photo of my uncles on my mother's side. I don't know if you can see that. They're all dressed up in drag, perfectly dressed up in drag, putting on South Pacific for my grandmother, who can't speak a word of English. My uncle Mario made a Frankenstein movie and throwing my aunt into the, into the lake. One funny thing after another. Life, spirit, and the pursuit of happiness. Gone. Gone. When, when, when did you notice it happened? Like, uh, it, I started like happening, it started happening during the Vietnam War. And again, I'm prime draft meat during that time. And that's when all the hippie stuff started to happen. And they started dressing down and the whole thing started going on. And the only re and again, I'm going to make this clear. I, at, as a young guy between the ages like 18 to 22, I believe the crap that they were shoving down the people's mouths that if we don't stop those commies in Vietnam, the dominoes are going to keep falling. I believed it. The only reason I didn't go into the service and they're drafting everybody is because I'm watching these pictures, guys walking up to water this high with guns over their head and 50 pounds of weight on their back getting shot at. 
I said, I don't want to do that. So I ended up going, again, I used to call this a greaser, you know, a greaser from the Bronx. The only school I could get into was in Charleston, West Virginia, 1965. And, and it was called Morris Harvey College, became the University of Charleston. I, I go to my father, I said, Pop, they're drafting everybody. What should I do? He says, listen, I got my own problems. You figure it out. I barely got out of high school. I got left back in the fifth grade. I only didn't go in there. I believe the crap that they were selling. So what I'm saying is when it went down, look what's going on now. Did you like the Afghan war? No, I like the two Iraq wars. Say, hey, how about that Yemen war? Let's get rid of that guy. No, how about the Ukraine war? We're the peace protesters. The only reason they were taking to the streets back then is because of the draft. So it became the bullshit crap of freedom love. Look at that little, all those uh, 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 Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. Oh, yeah, you anti-war guys. If you don't get the jab like me, we don't like you. Oh, yeah, all those anti-war guys that supported the COVID war. It's a bunch of hypocrisy. So that's when it all went down. And then it kept going down. And then he, the, the, in my lifetime, there were three things after the Vietnam War that killed society. And the same freak, that little Fauci fraud, the AIDS, that was number one. Man, I'm growing up at a time of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, man. You go down and see, it was wild times. It was free. You're going to get AIDS. No sex. You're going to get AIDS. AIDS was killing. It wasn't killing straight people. You can't keep taking it up the rear and sperm going into the bloodstream. Fact. And if you're overdosing on drugs, you're going to go out. We scared the crap out of everybody. That was the number one thing that started changing things. Number two. The war on terror. We're going to get that guy, Osama bin Laden, dead or alive. Man, it's seven, in 1974, I was working for a major corporation. I'm flying first class. Everybody's dressed up, man. I'm running late to the, all the time to the gate. You weren't getting felt up and getting electrocuted and all this bullshit. It was fun to fly. No more. 9-11 changed everything. You could go into any office building. You know, Let me see your data. That was none of that crap. And number three, the COVID war. The damage that the COVID war has done is incalculable. It's incalculable. It has destroyed the lives and livelihoods of billions of people across the planet. In our trend forecasting system, all things are connected. You look at what's happened with this, with this COVID thing. Now, hey, I'm 15 minutes from Woodstock over here. I'm in Kingston, New York. The first matter of fact, I used to go to Quebec a lot. I'm only four and a half hours from there. I loved it up there. I used to date a French woman. Anyway, now Woodstock, 10 o'clock at night, dead, dead. All the bar bars, streets, dead. Oh, and, and, then, and then, of course, the tough cops, you know, they pull you over. You didn't, the light on your, over your license plate was out. Where were you? How many drinks did you have? Stand on your head. Repeat the alphabet backwards. They suck the joy out of life. This COVID thing, dry cleaners are dried out. A third of them gone. We're talking about what's going on with the Silicon Valley bank bus and the other bank bus going on. That's nothing compared to it. Your office occupancy rates in New York City are 47%. In the 10 great cities, biggest cities in America, it's about 50.4%. That's according to Castle with a K. That's their analysis. So now all the businesses that depended on commuters... Gone, going out. Now, the big one is all those big office buildings that the big zone with all those trillions of dollars of debt as people are working from home now and only going back two or three days a week. And then I'm not going to renew my lease for 10 floors, somebody says. I'm only going to take two. And I'm the landlord and I got to pay my loan that with these kind of loans are more than just variable. They really go up a lot. 
after certain amounts of time, they do for very short periods. Now with interest rates up and your variable rate loan way up and less money coming in, you think you're going to have a banking collapse? You haven't seen anything yet. And so I said the COVID war has sucked the joy out of life. It killed the spirit of the people. Look, again, we wrote about this as it's happening. We only put the facts down. We warned. We warned about an office building bust three years ago. It's just making the news now. We warned when people lose everything and have nothing left to lose, they lose it. Hey, how about all those suicides? How about the drug addictions going way up? How about the crime rate soaring? Can't figure it out. We are going through the worst crisis in modern history. Back it up to the um, uh, office building rentals at all-time lows. Something carried them through the crisis itself, right? Like in Canada, government was handing out checks hand over fist. People were, uh, you had some portion of the rent that was guaranteed so that landlords didn't go bust. That, I presume, is what catches up with the industry at some point in time. The government stops printing the money yep. and people stop uh, paying their landlords or paying their rent. You got it. Again, <laughs> when the COVID war began, equity markets and the economy should have crashed. Stay home. Here's some money. Here's some billions. Here's billions. They, they created the worst financial crisis in human history by pumping in countless, countless trillions of dollars from the governments and then the banksters bringing the interest rates down to negative and zero, whether we're negative in Europe, in Japan, and therefore since 2000 and what, 12, and, and then keeping and putting them at zero. So now look at the phony housing boom that happened. Hey, you want to borrow money? Don't worry about it. You got all the any interest to pay on your loan. It's only like 2.3% or whatever. At the height, when, at, the, at the height during the COVID war, what about 3.5 or in, in America, 3.6. And now it's more than double that. So now let's put this all together. Every week we put in the trends journal. This is our 33rd week of doing it. Office uh, uh, people getting laid off around the country and around the world. <clears throat> in 2000, it, it just hit an all-time high of the number of people getting laid off. Not an all-time, but a, 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 a comparison to the panic of 08, the Great Recession. That's where it's hit right now. So now all the people losing jobs, how are they going to pay their bills? Oh, oh, wait a minute. Interest rates are going up. Your credit card debt's going up. You lost your job. You're barely making it now anyway. How are you going to pay your debt? 64% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. 64% of Americans paycheck to paycheck. That's right. That, that means uh, they don't have money saved. Just to state the obvious, if they miss a paycheck, they go into default on something. That's right. And now your interest rates are going up. So now, again, you know, people have no idea. They have no, but you know, it's, I, I keep thinking about this. You know, you ask me what's different. <laughs> Back in the day, the stores used to close like at six o'clock at night. Back in the day, nothing was open on Sundays. Nothing. Only the drug stores would be open until about 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, there were drug stores, not drug chains. I was a kid. I worked in a, as a soda jerk, they called them back in the day. I, I couldn't wait to get that job. All the kids from high school afterwards used to go to the soda fountain. And I met my one of my loves of my life being a soda jerk. I couldn't wait to do it. We were open on Sunday after church. We'd close because they pick up the newspapers. So what I'm saying is the family was always together. The family was together on Sundays. The family was together at nights. Now everybody's working two jobs. You know, I'll tell you what, you know, people will hate me for this, but I could give a shit. To me, what changed everything, and again, it happened in my generation, when they started telling women they have to go into the workforce and you're not being treated properly because you're not in the workforce. I mentioned to you as a kid, you know, I, I, you know, I, they, oh, they used to tie me, they used to, my brothers and sisters told me, they used to tie me to the crib 
with nylon stockings because I'm out the window. They couldn't control me. They'd have my parents locked up now. What I'm saying is now people have a kid three months old into a daycare center. Great. Great. A kid's growing up out of their mind. You don't know what the hell you are. You need a mother or a a grandmother, an aunt or uncle, if your mother has to work to love you. No, no. We're going to put you in a daycare center with a bunch of other kids out of their mind and the lowest paid people taking care of you and feeding you shit. Can't understand why 70% of Americans are obese. Why 42, uh, excuse me, 70%. 70% are overweight, 42% over be, are obese, 42%. You look at, again, my generation, Woodstock. Take a look at the photos of Woodstock, 1969. Poof, everybody's thin. When the women went to the workforce and let strangers raise their kids, to me, that was the beginning of the end. It went downhill big time and fast. Look what the people look like. Look what's happened to society. They're not raising their kids anymore. Strangers are raising them. In New Jersey over here, they're telling the kids at seven years old, you should begin to decide whether you're a man or a woman, a boy or a girl. What are you out of your mind? That's who's what that's who's running the world. These little freaks. Well, I mean, literally, Joe Biden, who has appointed people to his, um, I don't know, administration, uh, questionable nominees, but diverse nominees, that's for certain. Joe, but try to help me make sense of of one thing here. Hiking the interest rates. I understand the rationale, or at least I understand the explanation given. It's to stem or to curb inflation. I don't understand the mechanism or how that justification is actually supported by the, the evidence. If what is causing inflation is not, um, well, I mean, if what's causing the inflation is the fact that people have printed cash to burn, how does increasing the interest rate do anything other than, as some people say, deliberately or by design or just conveniently, accidentally, how does it do anything other than crash the economy the way we're seeing it crash now? What they're they're thinking is that when you crash the economy, people won't have any money to spend and it's supply and demand. This is their thinking. So that, and you could see it already, actually. You look at Brent crude. You're, you're looking at Brent crude now around $72 a barrel. You know, you go back just a couple of weeks ago, it was like $84 a barrel. So they're looking at supply and demand, and they think that that's going to bring it down. Yes, some of the commodities are going to go down, but that's not going to solve it. And I want to, before I go on further, I want to just stay on their whole thinking. You know what they're blaming this the inflation on? And again, these are not my words. Again, we write it in detail in the Trends Journal magazine. I'll take two guesses. One is Putin's war and the other is price gouging. Labor. Wage prices. People are getting more money and we got to bring down the wage increases. These are the words coming out of the Fed head. These are not my words. And this is what Wall Street is saying, the mainstream uh, business media. They're blaming it on raising wages. And then they're not. The wages are way behind inflation. And by the way, the real inflation number, if anybody wants to know what it is. 13%. Is it, 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 yeah. It's John William shadow stats. He puts the real numbers and it's double what it is. And, and before you go on there, explain to people how they falsify the inflation figures. Okay. You just saw housing prices go up 40% during this period. No, we're going to put that in there. Uh, it, 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 we're just going to do uh, overall rentals. And, and so we're going to make up a phony number. Oh, and by the way, people, the price of steak went up. No, no, they changed their diet. So it became a different kind of way that they're spending money. So we're going to make it an average. They did this for two reasons. The primary reason is that Social Security is related to the Consumer Price Index. So the higher the consumer price index, the more you have to pay the plantation workers of Slavelandia, whose money you've been stealing since they've been born, you, when they want Social Security. So you give them back less. We keep the inflation rate low. And number two, so the gamblers could keep gambling on Wall Street. 
and keep the interest rates low so the bigs could keep buying up everything. By the way, which they did in 2021, merger and acquisition activity was at an all-time high. Remember what I said to you when I was a kid? They had drug stores. They had stationary stores. They had grocery stores. They had hardware stores. Screw you. What stores? Only chains now. Only the bigs could own everything. So going back to inflation, where it's going, there's a place called Argentina. Their inflation rate just hit over 100% this week. The country's down in the crapper. People are starving. So high interest rates don't bring down inflation. They only bring it down in some levels. The people that are, look, don't believe me, believe the Fed head. What's his name over there? Jerome Powell. Let's go back two years ago. No, no, this isn't inflation. It's only temporary. No, no, this is not is not inflation. It's only transitory. And now let's call it transgendatory. Let's really be stupid about it. It, it, it identified as, trans, uh, as transitory. Uh, I mean, I remember, everybody should know, Yellen said it. This is transitory inflation, and yep. it was transitory. I mean, I guess she's right. It's transitory into permanent, and now it seems to be permanent, or at least yes. not transitory. So now going on to what caused it was it what you were saying about all the trillions of dollars that they pumped into the market and brought in, into the economy and brought interest rates down. They created a phoniest bubble in, in modern history. And it's busted. It's going down. Look what they just did with the Silicon Valley Bank. Okay, explain explain this here. Now, I understand the basics. Okay, people go to banks. You put your money. Uh, there was a great clip from South Park that's making the rounds. And, you know, I think it's Cartman goes to the bank and gives him 100 bucks. And he says, great, I'll take your 100 and I'll put it in account. We'll put in an interest B and it's gone. And so, and they did this with every customer at the bank and then said, if you have no money at the bank, get out of the line. We need people with money and it's gone. I understand the basic idea. You, you take your money to the bank. The bank doesn't sit with it in coffers. The bank invests the money that its clients have deposited in the bank. Some banks make good investments. Others make bad investments. With SVB, the Silicon Valley Bank, I don't know, they had like $210 billion in assets um, that were not worth, I guess, as much on paper as they might have said they were. Uh, they needed to get, uh, I don't know, issue new securities or something to raise $2.2 .2 billion, which caused people to panic. And they went and withdrew $42 billion in accounts that the bank couldn't cover. That's my, you know, idiot level understanding. Explain it in a little bit greater detail, just so people understand what gave birth to this crisis. Now, I'll tell you what gave birth to the crisis. Remember what we're talking about, Silicon Valley Bank. I, I, I like to call it silly con man. That's what they are. They're silly cons. There's a con artist. When the COVID war began, and again, we write about this in detail as it's happening. The guy Dorsey, that little clown freak. Again, you know, they say in the, in the King James Bible, the meek shall inherit the earth. They spelt it wrong. The geeks have inherited the earth. This was the first guy. He was supposed to go to South Africa. He announces he's not going and we're closing down Twitter, telling everybody to stay home. We're going back to the Silicon Valley bank bust. Following him, Microsoft, Facebook, Google. One Silicon after another. Stay home. Don't go to work. Schools closed down. You can't go on. You got online learning. You, people are staying home. You're Zooming to work. The tech stocks are booming. They're booming. Remember? They were the first ones to start the COVID war in America. It broke out in Kirkland, Washington, in nursing homes. What the hell is a Kirkland, Washington, right? Oh, that's the, near Amazon, that, that, that Washington? Yeah. Now people are ordering things online. The stocks are booming. Silicon Valley Bank, right? Now you got all these IPOs, all these SPACs. We're going to take advantage of this big boom in tech. Now the COVID war starts ending. Boop, boop, boop. All the tech stocks start going way down. Let's go back. What was it? 
I think the tech stocks down at the beginning of the year for the year where they were down 33% from their high. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now the Silicon Valley bank had all that dough coming in, all those tech companies and it's going down. Oh, and by the way, they had all these U S treasuries. Oh, what the interest rates went up and all those treasuries that were holding worth next to nothing. That's what happened. It was brought to you by the silicons. And by the way, they all started drawing their money out, the big companies. And what does the United States do? Going to bail them out? Bail out the rich. They bailed out the people, the big silicons and other con artists that had all this dough in the bank. You're only supposed to bail them out if they have $250,000, the FDIC. No, we're going to bail them all out. Oh, and it's not going to cost the taxpayer. Screw you. Of course it is. No, but just explain. I mean, other, other than saying the words, how does it, it doesn't, I'm not an idiot. It, it Even before the bailout, I said, this is already costing taxpayer dollars. I mean, somebody runs these organizations, these government institutions, the FDIC, but how does anyone say we're going to bail them out and it's not going to cost the taxpayer a dollar? It's bullshit. Total bullshit. And again, people swallow the bullshit. You know, that guy Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction and ties to Al-Qaeda. Total lie. Oh, by the way, I had a rally up here in Kingston, New York. Um, I have buildings on the most historic four corners. It was a peace and freedom rally. One of the speakers was Phil Giraldi. Phil Giraldi was a top, top CIA guy who goes into George Bush's office and says, President Bush, here's all the data, here's all the facts. There are no weapons of mass destruction in, a, in, um, in Iraq. You know what Bush told Giraldi? Leave Find the them. office. <laughs> told him, get out of here. You know what Giraldi did? He quit the CIA. Top guy. So when you're asking about how come they say, oh, and by the way, bullshit Biden, go back to his campaign. We will not bail out the banks. We will not bail out the banks. We will not bail out, period. They always say period, by the way, after it, period. Yeah, like that little arrogant, uh, this is what we're going to tell you to do, period. Yeah, they all do that. They put the period in, yeah. They're full of crap. Oh, by the way, <laughs> I was the assistant to the secretary of the New York State Senate, the guy that runs the whole show at 26 years old. I got photographs of me and Ronald Reagan when I picked him up to Chicago Hilton two days before he ran, announced he's running against Gerald Ford. I've been with presidents, prime ministers, and princes. I've been on the other side. I wouldn't know what I know if I wasn't on the other side. I was a chief government affairs specialist for the chemical industry back in the 70s. At 28 years old, I'm staying at the Willard Hotel and putting my meetings on at the Hay Adams. I was killing environmental legislation at the height of the environmental movement in the 70s. All I wanted to do was make money and have a good time. And then I started to grow up when I hit my round 32. So I wouldn't know what I know if I wasn't on the other side. If you haven't been there, don't tell me what it was or what it is. And so what I'm telling you and everybody is that what people call a government is nothing more than a crime syndicate. They're murderers and thieves. How many more wars do they have to start? And how many more people do they have to kill? And how much more money do they have to steal right in front of our eyes before you grow up and get it? I was going to say, you ran for you ran for the governor of New York, I believe? No, no, no. I, 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 I worked for the secretary... Nope. Uh, but I ran major political campaigns. Oh, you, you, I, never, you never actually ran for office? No, no, no. Oh, okay. I, I, I ran major campaigns in Westchester County, which is the richest county in, in America at the time. You know, I, I was with, I was, I, again, you know, I was there. I know what it looks like. And I, I, well, nobody could believe when I quit. It, it, what used to happen? We're in the back of the chamber in the, in the Senate. And, you know, I'm a young guy. You know, what are you talking about? You're talking about chicks you're talking about cause sports and all of a sudden we got a clown senator frank smith sergeant at arms opening i said what the hell what's this crap man what's, what's this guy they can't open the door by themselves and then my buddies would leave me follow the senator to his seat 
pull out the chair and help him sit down. And I come back. I say, man, what's the matter? You know, cat can't sit down by himself. He needs some help. I say, no, Gerald, you have that kind of an attitude. You're not going to make it here. I say, this isn't my trip, you know? Again, I'm a guy that grew up in the Bronx. My mother, may she rest in peace, situation would break out. I'm a little kid. And she'd say to me, I hate cowards. I hate cowards. I didn't know what a coward was. When I found out what it was, man, I'm not going to be a coward. You know, I'm not going to, you know, disgrace my mother, although I did a lot of other stuff she would have liked. But I quit, and none of my buddies could believe it. My friend Brian Donahue, may he rest in peace, his wife became the uh, lieutenant, gov uh, lieutenant governor in the Pataki. I saw what it is. The, guy, the people that are in politics, these are the people I hated in high school and college that wanted to be class president. And remember all those slimy little shitheads that told you what to do with the health ministers and health directors and all those creeps? Remember them? The people that are bureaucrats are the dumbest pieces of shit around that can't get a job in the real world, that bend over, take it up the ass to get the job. And they do what they told, and then they become the most arrogant. The most arrogant. And again, I'm telling everybody, you better stand up and fight and be a real man or woman. And here's the other deal. How arrogant these politicians are. Do this, do that, do this, do that. You call them out face to face and say, you know, fuck you. Don't you tell me what to do. Oh, don't talk to me like that. Who the fuck are you to tell me what to do? And you know what? They don't know whether to piss or shit. They're little clowns of nothing. And that's what the people, how can you take orders from a clown like Mitch McConnell with more fucking chins than Chinatown? How can you look up to a Lindsey Graham, a Chucky Schumer, a little arrogant true dope of Macron got sown over there in France? Look at the freak they had as the prime minister of the UK, Boris Johnson. You couldn't, a cartoonist could not come up with a little freakier piece of crap than him and people take orders from them. Okay, now let me ask you, uh, you, you I know you always say you don't give advice, you just um, observe, observe trends. Uh, I'm going to ask the obvious stupid question. It's not for advice. Where does this go? And is the end goal, or whether or not it's the end goal, is the end destination? Um, Full digital currency. Oh, Government absolutely. Absolutely. We wrote about this, the magazine cover three years ago, from dirty cash to digital trash. Here we're doing the interview, right? Gerald, something happened. The Russians just hacked our banking system. Sorry, folks, you don't have any money left. But don't worry, we came out with a new coin just for you. India is already digital. It's already there. You go back a few years ago, that guy Modi, oh, those old rupees you have, they're no good anymore. We're coming out with a new one. Yeah, yeah. And now even the poorest people, they put their phone up and they pay like that. China, get one after another. Holiday, we're going to have a bank. They had a bank holiday in America in 1933. Holiday? You can't get your money out. They created this fake bubble with all of this cheap money they pumped in, America got, what, a $31.7 trillion debt. Oh, interest rates are going up. I forgot. Now you got to pay more on your debt. They're going to come out with a new coin. They've already done it in China. And, and they're going to go digital. So to me, again, as I say, guns, gold, and a getaway plan. I'll tell you a quick Canada story. When I, This is no bullshit. When 9-11 happened, USA Today, when it was a big newspaper, they used to run my top trends every year. And they come, we put our top trends out in December, just before January. So in December 2000, and you can look it up, the headline was 2001 won't be our year, Trendseer says. And I'm not, I warned of a wave of anti-Americanism and that People wouldn't be safe at home or abroad. And in our Trends Journal, we had forecast in 1999 that the markets would crash by the second quarter of 2000, dot-com bust. 
So the dot-com bust is going on. Things are going down real bad. So I'm watching TV that day, CNBC, having a cup of coffee. We're taking away, you know, something just happened. A plane hit the Empire State, the uh, World Trade Center. You know, let's not get excited about this. Plane hit the, it's a beautiful, clear day out. I'm watching this thing. And all of a sudden, you Tuesday see that morning. picture, right? A beautiful, clear Tuesday morning. I think yep. I remember. And I used to, I used to do a lot of hot air ballooning. You know, I and I fly in private planes. You know, my buddy had a small plane. You know, so mm -hmm. I know, you know, speed and height and all this stuff. You know, this holy shit. The first thing I did after I call, I called my girlfriend up, and her name was Marie Pierre. Marie Pierre's brother Francois was the left shoulder of Jacques Chirac in Mitterrand. And I'm telling you, this is a Canada story too. And and she was from Paris, and she, but she lived near me up in, uh, when I lived in Rhinebeck, New York. I called her up. I said, Marie P., I get your money out of the bank. They say that, she said, Gerald, why? I said, he just hit the World Trade Center. Again, I'm a New Yorker. 35 miles north of New York is the Indian Point nuclear power plant. And they, they're telling us that planes are going down the Hudson River. If they hit that nuclear power plant, I said to myself, there's going to be chaos like you can't believe. She goes to the bank, Key Bank, they wouldn't give her her money. They called her anti-American. Marie Pierre being who she is, she got her money. Next thing I did, I call up the bank. I had certificates of deposit. Back in those days, you used to get money, interest on your money when you put it in the bank in CDs. I'm sorry, Mr. Salenti. Uh, certificates of deposit can't be traded right now. Wall Street is closed. I wanted my money transferred to the Rhinebeck Bank. I had my guns, gold, and a getaway plan. I had maps out in, in those days before. The, and I don't carry a cell phone, by the way. I did work for the cellular telecommunications industry and know about the dangers, the, the, the real facts about the dangers of cell phones. According to the University of Berkeley, California, the latest study, if you're on a phone for 17 minutes a day for 10 years, your chances of getting a brain tumor only increase by 60%. Anyway. I put out maps and now I have back roads going to Canada because I figured if there's a crisis going on here, I had Jerry jugs filled with, with, um, with, with gas. I had the maps going to Canada. It's only four, four and a half hours away from me. I was going to take the back road, sneak over the border. And I figured from Canada, I could go anywhere. I had my guns, gold, and a getaway plan. To me, gold is number one. I've been buying gold since 1980, excuse me, 1977 to 78 at $187.50 an ounce. I've been buying it since. I buy it and put it away, buy it and put it away, buy it and put it away, buy it and put it away. And if you don't believe me, go to what the central banks did in 2022. It was the biggest year they bought gold. They know how bad it's going to go. So they're going to come out with a digital currency. They're going to screw people out of everything. And they're giving and this bank bail. The bank crisis has just begun. Let me. I got. I got three questions here. A. You get gold. Where do you keep it? Because if you keep it in the bank, it's no safer there than cash in a in an account. Keep it at home. You risk theft. Two. Uh, if they go to digital currency, and if the shit hits the fan, what good is gold? Because you have to convert it into something to get what you need. You convert it into what they're selling to get what you need, but you're getting a lot more for your gold than what you're transferring it into. And you go back to any war in history, the gold got you out. The gold got you out. You could buy your way out with gold. And what was the other part of the question? Uh, where do you keep it? Where do you keep it? Use your head and figure it out. <laughs> I might use my butt like a- uh, Yeah, you know, really. cool yeah, you know, I'm smart about it. And number two, I've been saying this for years. Why would you keep your anything in the bank? Oh, I, I just told you what happened when I couldn't get my CDs, right? Why would you keep anything in the bank when they're making money on your money and giving you nothing back? Why would you keep money in the bank? Why? Well, what, what's the alternative? You yeah, put it someplace in a mattress. You, know, you don't put it under a mattress. I mean, look, you got, you, you can, I can't find my shit around. I go to like, a, what is it? Somebody's going to, oh, here it is. I mean, you know, use your head and you figure out what to do with it.
Um, and you don't have to keep it in your house. Uh, what do you, again, I know it's not financial and advice. And there are other places, there are other things, like you go to King World News and they get a lot on gold. And there are different places where you can hold gold safely. Uh, what's your opinion on, uh, they're not ETFs, but they're shares in companies that hold your physical gold. So you're holding a physical gold, but it's through an exchange. Yeah, the ETFs, the GLDs. I have some in that. And the reason I do is for tax purposes. So I put my, you know, 401, you know, I, I put them into GLDs. So yeah, I'm taking a risk on that, but they say the gold is there. May or may not happen. You might lose on it, but it's an easy way to do it. And again, for tax purposes, I don't want to put my money into the stock market. I put it into GLDs. Something you've said time and time again, and I, I, probably a very simple answer. Markets are volatile in March and October, which is why uh, a number of your predictions were, were based on March events, including the most recent one. Why are markets volatile March and October? What happens is that, let's go, okay, let's go to October. You got the summer season, right? And nothing happens during the summer. People are on vacation, you know, the markets are quiet. September happens, it doesn't, September doesn't begin until the second week of September. Now October. Now you're seeing the big companies on what they're doing, on how much they're buying for the holiday season coming up. So you can see what they're doing at the big retailers to see how big they're going to be buying for for the holiday season. And number two, reality starts to set in in October after the summer holidays. So then you start, they start, people start focusing on the reality of what's happening. March, it's the same thing. You got the Christmas holidays and you have January, February, and then reality starts setting in again. You go back to January. Well, markets are way up. Markets are way up. Holiday, you got that holiday feeling. And then February comes in and things start getting reality and March comes. So that's the way, the, 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 those are the two volatile months is the way we see them. All right. And, um, uh, there was another thing you said back in the day when the government asked people to turn in their gold to subsidize the government. Uh, I, ne I need you to flesh that out and explain what that what that is. I mean, I, having never lived through it, and you said well, your I grandfather lived through it. in 1930 in 1933, they called it bank holiday, and you had to turn in all your gold. If you didn't turn in your gold, you go to jail. Again, my father told me the story. He said, you know, he said, you know, he said, I went over to your grandfather's house, and he's packing up all this gold. My my grandfather, by the way, worked is a, a labor on the George Washington bridge. You know, they, they worked hard. And they, they made money and saved it. He said, your grandfather's packing up this gold. I said, pop, he said, what are you doing with that? He said, oh, he said, the president wants us to return the gold because we have to help America. My father said, what are you getting? Why don't do that? And my grandfather got all mad at him because he was so proud of being an American. My grandfather, you know, from coming from Italy, you know, during world war one and then, you know, coming to America so he did anything the government told him to do. So the people turned in their gold because the government needed the money. Will they do it again? They may try, but this time it ain't going to work. Is there any realistic, any realistic possibility of going back to a gold standard? Some, well, yes. And you're seeing it going to happen when the bricks start taking over. They've had enough of America hegemony. I mentioned to you, you know, I, I just pulled up one of the covers of the Trends Journal. This is when it used to be a quarterly. It's a weekly now, over 170 pages. Uh, yeah, you're, I got a copy beforehand, but there was too much to read before this morning's interview. Right. You see, so this is, you see how happy that guy is? This is an article by Dr. Paul Craig Roberts. Dr. Paul Craig Roberts is the former assistant, assistant treasury secretary in the Ronald Reagan. A good friend of mine. Washington is driving the world to the final war. World hegemony is not a right America has earned. This is all about the overthrow, the United States overthrow, the democratically elected government of Viktor Yanukovych in Ukraine in 2014. All the facts are there. I'm mentioning this because you're talking about gold standard. Hegemony. The world is tired 
of America hegemony, not only on the geopolitical front, but on the economic front. They've had enough. They're finished. So you're looking at countries, the BRICS. You'd look at what? Brazil, Russia, India, China. What's the population of those? Well, let's just put China and India together. That's half the world, give or take. Right, two point what? Uh, two point two point uh, two billion in China, and I th- no, I think India point, just overtook China. One point four billion in China and 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 India. So it's at two point eight billion. What does America have? Three hundred thirty-two million. Depends. What did you Europe have? Ca- Europe counting have? illegals or, or 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 illegals, but yeah, America's like three hundred and forty million. Well, they say three hundred thirty-two, the official number, and and you got Europe. What about four hundred million? With three, so anyway, they're nothing. They've had enough. The dollar is going to die when interest rates go down. The only reason the dollar is up is because of high interest rates. When the dollar starts low, go lowering interest rates, which they're going to start doing this year, we forecast, you're going to see the dollar decline Gold prices go up and you're going to start seeing more and more countries go by the gold standard. It's going to be a standard, we believe, of the BRICS. Um, okay. Not financial advice, but for- forecasts. Forecasts. Uh, now, the question is this also is something you said time and time again, and you've lived longer than I have, although I've seen it in my shorter lifespan. All roads lead to war. In an attempt to get them out of this financial crisis, they'll create or fabricate or exacerbate international conflict. Uh, I mean, we're we're already there, but does it get worse or does it get better? And one of my sayings is when all else fails, they take you to war. Again, what followed followed the Great Depression? World War II. What followed the dot-com bust? War on terror. And it's not look, the United again. It's it's again we take a global nomic viewpoint. Look what's going on in the Middle East: protest day, week after week, week after week in Israel, because of the new judiciary law they're putting in, where there's basically no courts anymore, and the politicians are in charge of everything. They they're ramping up on and on again. We write about this every week. They're ramping up war against Iran. If military conflict breaks out between Israel and Iran, World World War III has already begun. It was a cover of our magazine on Jan- uh, February 22nd, 2022. From COVID war to Ukraine war, this is two days before Russia invaded. From COVID war to Ukraine war to World War. If I said to you, hey, man, listen, give me some guns and a, and a hand grenade. I want to go kill the guy next door. You gave them to me. You're an accessory to the crime. NATO and, Amer- and the United States are at war with, with Russia. If war breaks out between Israel and, and Iran, yeah. but World War III explodes, oil prices, gas, Brent crude over $130 a barrel, a global financial crisis. When all else fails, they take you to war. Here, you can look this up. You put in um, sanctions on Japan, 1941. You Google it in. It brings you to History Today, establishment website. In July 1941, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt seized all Japanese assets Why? Because the Japanese invaded French Indochina. This is July 1941. Japan in Pearl Harbor, December 1941. So this is a couple of months before. Invaded French Indochina. What's a French Indochina? Oh, you mean the French that invaded and took over? Oh, we'll call it colonization. Vietnam, Laos, 
and Cambodia to steal their tin and rubber and enslave the people and kill who they wanted to? How dare the Japanese go there when the French are there? What the hell do I care? Oh, I should care because, again, this is in history today. They also took over Cameron Air Force Base in Vietnam, which was only 600 miles from where the Americans were in the Philippines. What the hell are the Americans doing in the Philippines? Oh, it got worse. They also took over the air bases in Singapore and threw out the British. Why, how dare they? The sun never sets on the British Empire. Why, those dirty Japanese? Oh, and also Dutch Indochina, they too came out against the Japanese. Oh, what are the Dutch doing in Indochina? Well, we can take anything we want from Indonesia. What the hell's the matter with you? They put sanctions on Japan. Again, this is in history today. That caused the Japanese to lose three quarters of their global trade, export trade. Oh, that's how they make all their money, by exports. They just went lost three quarters of everything? That's right. Oh, I forgot. Also, in history today, they cut off 88% of Japan's oil supply. 88% of their imported oil. They need 100%. They only had 12%. Can't understand why they bombed Pearl Harbor. Blow me away. World War III's already begun. It's either going to be a false flag event, a nuclear exchange that's going to make it official. And the people are going to march off with the stupidity because they have no idea about anything. And again, to show you the level of stupidity, 88% of the Americans were so stupid, so ignorant that they believed the little daddy's boy with a pair of balls, probably smaller than a mothball, an arrogant little piece of stupid shit, George W. Bush. We're going to get that guy... Osama bin Laden, dead or alive. The 20-year Afghan war that 88% of the American people supported. They'll support war against Russia, war against China like that. Just like they marched off to the COVID war, the people do what they're told. When you say guns, gold, and a getaway car, uh, Gerald, what, what, what happens, a getaway plan? Where is, let's say, where is there to go I mean, are, are we look? And I'm not asking for like doomsday World War Three predictions, but you know, in, in the states, it's, it's well, over. It's over around the world. Life will change. Look how the COVID war destroyed life. Look how it sucked the joy out of life. Oh, you're going to build a bomb shelter. Oh, it's going to be great when you come out. Yeah, you know, going to boogie before the. Oh, you're going to have a great time. Why? What do you again? Don't believe me. Read John F. Kennedy speech June 1963 to the graduating students at American University. You could Google it up. It's all about peace. He warns that if there is a war between the United States and the Soviet Union, Russia, life on earth will be destroyed within 24 hours and it will be destroyed for generations. That's his words. He also goes on to say that during World War II, no country suffered more than the Soviet Union because of Hitler's Operation Barbarossa, which Kennedy says killed over 20 million people in Russia and destroyed their land, their factories, their homes, farms, equal to from Chicago to the East Coast, and that we should not hate the people of the Soviet Union. They are kind, loving, caring, very intellectual and technologically advanced people, and that we need peace. Boom. Five months later, Jack, you're dead. They assassinated him. He wanted peace. I have a photo of me and John Connolly. That's John Connolly is the guy that took the bullet in the back sitting in front of Kennedy, Governor Connolly. He wanted to meet me in 1992. I have a picture of me, him, and his wife, Nellie, 
in front of the big book depository where allegedly Clint, uh, uh, Kennedy got shot. He's sitting in front of Kennedy and took the bullet in the back. I'll make a very long story short. He wanted to meet me, by the way, because I had forecast in my book, Trend Tracking, uh, far better than Megatrends, Time Magazine, back in the late 1980s, that there'd be a new third party and someone like Ross Perot would be the candidate. So this is two weeks before the 92 elections. And he told the story what happened that day. We're going back into the Anatole Hotel. And he said to me, you know, Gerald, I read your book. He said, a fine piece of work. That's why he wanted to meet me. And he said, I know your heart's in the right place. He said, but you don't have a clue what's going on. And neither do the American people. Because if they did, there'd be a revolution in this country. This is not only the John Connolly that was a Democratic governor of Texas that took the bullet in his back. This is the John Connolly that was the Secretary of State under the Republican Richard Nixon that took us off the gold standard. Got it? It's a crime syndicate. Now, there was someone who said this guy is nothing but sunshine and lollipops, but I mean, re reality sometimes is not easy to swallow. Uh, Gerald, do you have any optimism or any, any not financial advice, but rather life advice? What can people do? Yeah. Where's the it's silver very lining? Simple. It's very simple. Get in the best shape you can, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. You're in the fight for your life. The higher you get, the better shape you're in. You never, I never stop learning. I never stop learning. I read, I read a minimum of six hours a day. I keep learning and learning and learning. You cannot stop learning. And most important, not most important, equally important, do something positive every day to make change happen. Whether it's helping somebody, anything you can do, do something positive. And most of all, you're born to be free. Nobody's to tell you what to do, how to do it, or when to do it. Do what you want to do that you believe is the best for you. You know, critical care nurses, you know, I, I was a speaker at the Rage Against the War Machine rally in Washington, D.C. on February 19th. And Ron Paul was one of the speakers as well. And I've done a number of events for Ron Paul. And we see each other. Hey, how you doing, man? You know, he's 86 years old. He goes, Gerald, he says, I come here and do this. He said, because I know that every time I'm doing something positive, I'm really doing something positive for myself. And critical, I said to him, you know, I said, critical care nurses say that the greatest regret that they hear from people that are dying is that they didn't become the person they could have become or did what they wanted to do. So that's it. You got to get out on a high note. And I'm doing everything. I put my money with my heart, my mind, and my soul. Are. Again, I, I launched Occupy Peace. You know, I, I put out a magazine. Every time we put it out, I asked this, please make it be the best it could possibly be. You have to do the best it could possibly do. You know, when you shortchange, you're only shortchanging yourself. I, I, I'm going to kill my, I'm going to regret it if I don't ask. You said you were a small kid growing up. May I ask how tall you are? Oh, five, six and a half. You're still taller than me, Gerald. Damn it. <laughs> I was thinking, maybe, maybe just once I felt. Um, and, and By I'll the way, I also had my own school. I taught close combat for many years. So it's not just talk. You know, it's the reality. The stronger you get, the more you respect yourself and you do what you can to bring life to a higher level. So that's how tall are you? Uh, well, five, five and a half, but I can say five, six on a good day. Although <laughs> I used to do judo as a kid. So uh, you know. Roman yeah. wrestling, and I'm taking uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu self-defense now. I mean, I, you're right. Is you know, The stronger you are, the stronger you are. And, I, and, keep, and as a short guy, smaller guy, you got to punch above your weight. That's what you have to do. So people say to me, you know, calm down. Don't, don't tell me to calm down. You got to punch above your weight. It's organic. So that's another important thing to know. 
Now I know that you had an hour and we're at an hour. All uh, right. Gerald, where I, I, I ordinarily I would end this with you and we'd say our proper goodbyes, but I'm going to continue going live afterwards um, on rumble, but Gerald, I'll put all the links in there. People love you. I think everybody here knows you, but for those who may have just discovered you, where can they find you? Where can they get trends journal? How can they support you? And um, where can they go to get not financial advice, but forecasts so they can make the best decisions for themselves. The Trends Journal, trendsjournal.com, trendsjournal.com. It's the grand total of $2.86 a week. It's nothing. It's a shitty cup of coffee at one of these crappy places. By the way, every day I grind my coffee by hand, my espresso, because when you grind it by hand, it doesn't burn the beans. When you put it in a blender, it goes, it burns the beans. So anyway, it's only, so I'm talking about lousy coffee. Every morning I have, I have my espresso with a little, I started putting some anisette in there now rather than sugar. So it gives me that little high, a little high, you know. But again, we're giving you everything we can. There's no magazine, there is no magazine in the world that gives you in-depth trends analysis and trend forecasts like the Trends Journal. Socioeconomic and geopolitical. We tell you what in the world is going on what it means, what's next, and our trend forecast, what's next and what you might want to do. The motto of the magazine is think for yourself. And that, by the way, came from my father when I was a kid, when I shoot my mouth off, repeating what I used to hear on the media. He'd say to me in Italian, Papagallo, stop repeating what everybody else is saying and think for yourself. Amazing. Gerald, thank you very much. Let's do this again anytime. You're yeah. you're always welcome. It was it's fantastic, and and I I, I love what you do. And thank you, I and think, thank you for what you're doing. I really appreciate it. Uh, my, my pleasure, Gerald. Thank you very much. Enjoy the day. Bye bye now. See you soon, everybody. That was amazing. I tell you, not only does he remind me of my father, his name is Gerald, and my dad's middle name is Gerald. He's the youngest of five kids. I'm the youngest of five kids. There are no coincidences. No, that's a joke. That it is kind of it's kind of cosmic and kind of amazing. Um, well, I'm gonna think of what to do with the rest of my day. Everybody, I'm gonna go over to Rumble, uh, do a couple of stories there because there's still some stuff to talk. You're gonna want to come over to Rumble, people, because if you thought the world had gone mad, uh, you'd be right. But it's it the the depths of the madness seem to be infinite. We seem to be heading full-fledged into a black hole of intellectual madness. When you read this, um, I don't know if it's an article, a publication from uh, the Cancer Society of Canada, you're going to want to read it. So we're 2,000 people here. Let's move on over to Rumble. Link is there. Uh, then I'm going to go do some Rumble rants, and then I'm going to go over to Locals, talk over to the Locals group um, exclusively as well. Damn, I like Gerald. Okay. Ending on YouTube. In three, two, one.